right this time. I am a polemicist. You're correct. Uh, most people are looking blankly. You have no idea what that means. How many people know what a polemicist is? Wow. One hand. One hand. That's it. Well, I am the one. Uh, a polemicist is the opposite of an apologist. You all know what an apologist is, right? Apologetics? No. Okay. Well, we got a real problem here today. <laughs> all right. Well, you know you have a football team, right? You, what's your team here? I don't, I don't know. I'm a Philadelphia fan, so we're the pitch. I'm getting five different answers, so I assume. Nonetheless, every one of your football teams has a defense, right? You have a defensive team. Am I correct? And the defensive team, they're made to, they're, their job is to make sure that the others don't score against them, right? Uh, in fact, they have a completely different skills than the other team, which is the offensive team. Am I correct? Now, in Christianity, defense is apologetics. And in most schools, most Bible schools, and certainly most seminaries, there are classes on apologetics. And there's also, in fact, you can get an entire degree on apologetics. One of my master's degrees is in apologetics, but not Islamic apologetics. That doesn't exist when I was going through seminary. So it's fascinating. We're great at defense because we do it all over the world. We've done it for 2,000 years because everybody is attacking Christianity. And so you have to have defense against the, the uh, Catholics. Uh, you have to have defense against the Jehovah Witnesses, the Mormons who would knock on your door, and especially against the atheists and the humanists who are attacking not only the existence of God, but everything else about us. So defense is very important. But hold on a minute. What's the best kind of defense? What did Vince Lombardi say? The best defense is a good offense. Am I correct? Offense. You have an entire team on a football team called the offensive team, a completely different team with completely different skills. Am I correct? They are the best known. They are the ones that win the game. They are the ones that score against the other. And yet we in Christianity don't have offense. It's offensive to talk about offense. And what is offense in Christianity? Polemics. And that's what I am. I'm the guy that does all the offense, and I am very offensive. <laughs> and I do not at all apologize for that. I am offensive to a Muslim because everything I say confronts his God, confronts his prophet, and confronts his book. And I do not apologize for that. For 25 years, I've been in London, England. I was there. I went there in 1992, and I remember when I went into the the office, uh, the embassy there in New York City to get my visa. In, to get to a visa to become a missionary in Britain takes about a year and a half. I went into there thinking I was going to start the process going. I sat there at the table and the man who was across from me says, why do we want you to, why should you come to England? Why do we need you in England? And I said, because you've got a problem. You have here in London a million Muslims. Some of the most radical people on earth are all making their way to England, and especially to London, because you are the people that invite everybody. You have no restriction. Am I going too fast? Boy, look at it. Can she keep up with me? Well done. I have to slow down, don't I? Okay, so I better slow down. I'm going to go to sleep. I'm hopeless at slowing down. How do you think I win all my debates? It's just by outdoing the others. Now, I said to this person who was standing in that, across from me, or seated across, I said, listen, you've got a real problem with radical Islam. They're coming in huge droves. You are acquiescent. Britons, British are the most acquiescent in Europe. There are no restrictions against Islam in Europe. Did you know that? It's the only country in Europe that has no restrictions. It's the only country in Europe that is, has Islamic courts. Islamic now is now legitimate in Britain since 2009. And I said, you have no idea how to deal with these guys and gals. I do. I have a master's degree in Islamics. I now have a doctorate in Islamics. And my doctorate is in Islamic polemics and apologetics. I'm the first in the world to get one on that because it doesn't exist. I had to create it. And now we are doing Islamic apologetics and polemics. And I'm going into 43 countries all over the world to train up people how to offend Muslims, but I don't want to offend Muslims. That's not my job. They get offended because of what I'm saying about their God, what I'm saying about, especially about their prophet, and what I'm saying about their book. But do we get offended when people criticize Jesus? No. Do we get offended when they criticize our God? Absolutely not. 
Do we get offended when they criticize our Bible and they've been criticizing it for 200 years? No, we say, bring it on. You can criticize Jesus all you want, and he, sit, he stands up to every criticism. That's why we love it when we defend our Lord Jesus Christ. Muslims don't like that. They don't like it all even when we offend, when they take on Issa. They have a hard time when we take on Muhammad. But that's my job. That's what I'm trained to do. Now, what's fascinating is when I go around the world and when I talk, especially in churches, when I get in, I bring this up, it causes an awful lot of problems because Christians don't like to offend anybody. Christians love to be loved. Am I correct? You all want to be liked. You want to be loved. And so what you do is you find everything to keep from offending anybody, and so you placate everybody, and you try to find amelioration with everybody, you find, find commonality with everybody, so the gospel here in the United States has become one of peace and reconciliation. Am I correct? And I'm a Mennonite. That is our mantra. Peace and reconciliation. Where in the Bible does it talk about peace and reconciliation as the gospel of Jesus Christ? Show me one verse that says the gospel of Jesus Christ is peace and reconciliation. The gospel is offensive, especially to Muslims. Christ is very clear that he has not come to bring peace. He has come to bring the sword. Not a sword that we use. Look at the very next verse in chapter 10 of Matthew, verse 34. Look at verse 35. To set father against son, to set mother against daughter. The offense is going to be against us. The sword is going to be against us. Sorry. The offense is against the Muslims, but the sword is going to be against us. We're not to use the sword. We're going to get the sword. And if you have any doubt, look at the entire chapter of Matthew 10. Commissioning of the 12 disciples. Take a look and read it. Here you see God... Jesus sending out the 12 disciples, commissioning them. He says, I'm sending you out as lamb before wolves. You're going to be hated for my name. Hated? How many of you are hated for Jesus' name? You're going to be persecuted for my name. How many of you have been persecuted for Jesus' name? A few hands. You're going to be jailed for my name. How many of you have been put into prison because of Jesus' name? You're going to be flogged when you're in prison for my name. How many of you have been flogged for, for my name, for his name? And finally, you're going to be killed. Well, you wouldn't be here if you had been killed for Jesus' name. Those are the five things that Jesus promises at the commissioning of the 12 disciples. Every one of the 12 disciples was hated. Every one of them was persecuted. They were all put in prison. Every one of them was flogged. And they were all killed except for John. They all received their commissioning. Now, how many of you get commissioned like that? I didn't get commissioned like that when I went into the Brethren in Christ out into missions. No one commissioned me like that. And yet, that's exactly how we should be commissioned. The gospel of Jesus Christ is offensive for folks. Anytime you say to a Muslim that God took on human form and entered time and space, that's offensive. Anytime you say that God died on the cross, that's offensive. And anytime you say... That Allah is not God. That is offensive. Folks, I can't open my mouth without offending Muslims. I have to. Because that is what the gospel is. Now, how, I know I'm not, I'm not persuading many of you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how exactly that works. Oh, before I do that, I've been told I have to flog these books. So let me do that. These are, by the way, if you came in here, do you see a tent back there outside the front entrance? There is a book table there. Lots of amazing stuff. You've got to go buy them. These three here books are by Sam Solomon. This is a hero of mine. Sam Solomon works, has worked with me. We've been to Ethiopia together. We've, we've worked in London together. He uh, has memorized the Quran in Arabic. He has memorized the Quran, which is the holy book of Islam in uh, Urdu. And he's also memorized it in English. Three languages. He knows every verse of the Quran. You ask him any verse, he can recall it in all three languages. How many of you could do that? It's the size of your New Testament. He was head of all the Islamic courts in Pakistan for nine years. And he's not even Pakistani, nor does is Urdu his native tongue. That shows you the caliber of the man we're talking about. But this man met Jesus Christ. And he fell in love with Jesus. And we cannot stop him. Isn't this great? Once you fall in love with Jesus, 
He was going 100 miles for Muhammad. Once he found Jesus, boom, he's going 100 miles an hour for Jesus Christ now. That's why he's so dangerous. So his books here are probably the best written on understanding Islam from inside Islam. Go and buy them. They're in the bookshelf, uh, the bookstore out there. Here's another one. If you want to look at how to take down the Quran, which is not what I do, you need to get this book. If you want to know how to defend the Bible, you need to get this DVD. This is my DVD. Um, you know, if you come to London, you go to the British Museum, the finest institution, as far as I know, that has more artifacts that support our Bible than any other museum on earth. God bless the British. Everywhere they went, they stole everything and put it into that building. <laughs> and by doing it, they have artifact after artifact that supports the first and second Kings, first and second Chronicles, first and second Samuel, the book of Genesis, the book of Daniel, the book of Jeremiah. It's amazing what they have in one place. But people walk right past it, don't even know it's there. So we put together an entire tour of this, and this is now on the DVD. Now guess what? In Washington, D.C., there is a new Museum of the Bible, which has just been opened up less than a year. And on, if you ever get to Washington, go to that museum, go to the fourth floor, and you will see almost all the artifacts that are in this DVD have been brought into that floor. I think they saw my DVD and they went and made facsimiles of every one of those artifacts where you don't have to go all over the museum to find them. They're all in one place and you will be surprised how great our Bible is. It's amazing what God has placed on the earth. You know, if we're not going to talk about God, we're not going to talk about our Bible, the rocks have been placed there to talk for us. And that's why you need to get this video, watch it, and see how great our Bible is. Now, that's things for that I had, to, I had to say because I need to go on. There's one or two other things I, I want to say. A lot of you will find that, I, that there's an awful lot that I'm going to throw at you this morning. It's probably going to go in this year and out this year. That's understandable. But you'll want to know how to learn this material. You'll want to know how to talk to your Muslim friends. And I hope every one of you have some Muslim friends. There's 600,000 of them here in the Los Angeles area. You shouldn't have any problem finding Muslims around you. Maybe they're working with you. Maybe they're in your family. Possibly they're your neighbors. Maybe they're in your school. Find them. See where they are. Go up to them and say two things. Say, Jay Smith told me that I'm to tell you that I believe that Jesus is God and I believe the Bible is the Word of God. Do you have an opinion? See what happens. You may get six hours of opinion. God bless them. They're the best people on earth. That's why I've been working with them for 37 years. Now, I forgot to tell you what happened at the embassy. I was sitting there and I told them, you need my help. You don't know what to do with these radical Muslims. He looked at his watch and he says, if you've got 45 minutes, I'll give you your visas right now. I walked out of the building with all visas from my whole family, and we've been there for 25 years, taking on radical Muslims. They're my favorite because they are the ones that understand not only their own scriptures, they understand their God and they understand Muhammad. And that's why I want to engage with them. So what I'm going to do this morning, I'm going to show you how easy it is and how different Islam is from Christianity. And I'm going to make everyone from this aisle over, you're all going to be Muslims. I know you don't want to, I'm going to make you Muslims for at least half an hour, okay? I want you all to say, Allahu Akbar. Come on, come on, you got to be better Muslims than that. Allahu Akbar. With real enthusiasm, please. Allahu Akbar. What is she saying over there? That's amazing. I have to learn how to say that in sign language so that I can scream it from, the, from my ladders at speaker's corner. Over on this side, you're going to remain Christian. Look at you. Aren't you great? Lots of smiles over here. Jesus is Lord. They're a lot better than you guys and gals. For obvious reason. Now, you're going to start getting sour-faced after about 20 minutes. You're going to get angry after about 30 minutes. We'll convert you all back, okay? Don't worry. But what I want to do, I'm doing this as a reason, because just to show you visually, and also try to think as well. Now, you, what's your name? No, it's Abdul now, okay? You're going to be Abdul. You're going to be my primary Muslim, okay? I'm going to use you especially. Abdul, remember that word? Abdul means slave. Abdul Rahman al Rahim. Whenever you see the word Abdul, that means slave of one of the names of God, okay? Are you Abdul now? Yes, say yes. And always say yes to everything I do. Be a good old... Listen, Islam by definition does not mean peace. Islam is a fourth form verb in Arabic. It has always meant obedience. It has always meant submission. Are you an Arab speaker? Someone's saying yes to me. Are there any Arab speakers here? Anybody speak Arabic, please? Someone? No one? At the very back. Is, am, I, am I correct on that? Could you come up here and sit at the front? I want to use you. Could you? My Arab friend. Come on up here. 
Are you a Christian? Of course, then I want you to sit on this side. You're going, to be, uh, you're going to be Ahmed, my Christian friend, okay? You're going to be Abdul, my Muslim friend, okay? I want you to first shake hands, both of you. Come over here and shake each other's hands. There, the Christian, the Muslim. We love the Muslims. Please get that right. We love the Muslims. We just don't love Islam, okay? Do you see the distinction? We love the Muslims, but not what Islam has done to them. And that's why we're going to do a dissident. Now, Ahmed, you're going to be my Christian brother, and Abdul, you're going to be my Muslim brother, okay? Here we go. What I'm going to do, I'm trying to get, I'm trying to go, well, uh, I have 13 areas that I would like to do, but I can see that clock's clicking down, and they won't let me go through all 13. So let's go, and let's try with some major areas. Let's talk, and let's begin at the very beginning. Sounds like I'm in Sound of Music. Let's start at the very beginning, a very good place to start. Instead of do, re, mi, I think we need to start with Genesis 3, okay? So open up your Bibles, go to Genesis 3, and look at two verses. Now, you all know that Genesis 3 is the story of the fall. This is where everything went wrong. This is when I was in Sunday school. I hated Genesis 3. I couldn't wait to get to Genesis 4. I was so glad when I got to Genesis 3, and when I did read it, I suddenly had an aversion towards all fruit. And that's why I don't eat fruit today. Ask my wife, I I lie not, I do not like fruit because of Genesis 3. In fact, I usually have an Apple computer right here, and I cover it up. My Apple computer, you cannot see that Apple because it has a bite taken out of it. And you know what that means. Steve and Job, I don't know, I can't be sure, but I'm sure he put that on there just to take the mickey out of the Christians. Nonetheless, that's to remind us of that sin. Genesis 3 is the story of the fall, but let's look at two verses. I want to read two verses in Genesis 3. If you open up your Bible, let's go ahead and let's start with verse 8. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Have you heard these verses before? Of course you have. It's in the story. How many of you have heard, how many have you have heard anybody preach on these two verses? Ahmed, have you? Yes, you have. These are good verses, aren't they? In fact, Ahmed, I would suggest that these two verses are probably key to almost everything we're going to read from the rest of the Bible. How do I know that? Well, take a look what these two verses say. These two verses tell me who God is. These two verses tell me who we are as humans. These two verses tell me what paradise was like. These two verses tell me what went wrong. And these two verses tell me what needs to get back, what we need to get back to paradise again. Am I correct? Now, you're probably going to say no. I'm probably imposing on these two verses a lot more than what they say. I will stand accused. But bear with me in the next half hour. I'm going to use this as my hermeneutical key. What does that mean? I don't know, but it's a big word and it sounds pretty pretty amazing, but I think it means, and I'm going to use it to interpret everything else about how we need to talk to Muslims, how you need to talk to Abdul, okay? So bear with me, let's go through and use that as our key, and let's start with that because that's in the Garden of Eden. Now on this side, do you have the same story in the Quran? Yes, you do. In chapter 2 of the Quran, in chapter 7 of the Quran, and in chapter 20 of the Quran. Abdul, just say yes, okay? Of course you do. And you've read it many times. Yes, say yes. But you have not, not realized that the story you have got sounds very similar than the story that Ahmed has. The difference is there are three major differences. And that's why I'm going to unpack this real quickly and show you why. In your story, you have a Garden of Eden, but where is that garden? It's not on earth. It's up in space. Where is your garden? It's on earth. Am I correct? Now, if it's in space, you would think God's there, right? Allah is there. Allah's not in your garden. Is God in your garden? Yes, he is. He was there walking in the cool of the day. Cool of the day. That means he probably did this every day. This is something he would do habitually with Adam and Eve. And if you're walking, you better have a pair of legs. If you're talking and calling out, where are you? You better have a pair of lungs and you better have a mouth. Which means he has human form. Your God came as a man and walked on earth. Your God is nowhere there. Your Garden of Eden doesn't even have Allah in that garden, yet it's up in space. Our God comes down our direction. This is the second category. Let's look at these two gods then. 
What does this say about our God versus your God? Our God enters time and space. Our God comes down to where we are. Our God limit himself, and our God takes on our form, and our God talks to us. Now, if that is so, here is the omnipotent God that can do everything. In fact, he created everything on in heavens and earth. Just say, yes, that's true. So he's omnipotent, but he's also omnipresent. He can be both on, in heaven and on earth simultaneously. Am I correct? Absolutely. And he also is asking, where are you? Now, don't you think he knew where Adam and Eve were? Of course he knew where they were. He knew they were hiding behind the tree. He is also omniscient, all-knowing. So the God we have here is omnipotent, omnipresent, and also omniscient. The three omnis that we're looking for. Now, let me ask you, Abdul, is your God omnipotent? Just, you better say yes to this. Every Muslim will say yes. So just follow me, be obedient, be submissive. Yes, he is omnipotent. All right, if your God is omnipotent, you always say, Allahu Akbar. That means God is the greater, right? If he is so great, why can't he t enter time and space? Ooh, two, 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 two. If God is so omnipotent, why can't he take on human form? Don't ever limit God. And whenever you Muslims say God cannot take on human form, you're limiting him. My God, I will not limit like that. My God can take on, in fact, my God can take on any form he wants, right? Remember when they, were going through the, uh, for, when they were going through the desert, the children of Israel? Wasn't that God that was leading them as a pillar of cloud during the day and as a pillar of uh, fire at night? That was God that was in the form of a cloud. God was in the form of a, a fiery pillar. My God, our God can take on any form he wants. Wasn't God in the burning bush with Moses in Exodus 3? That was God in the burning bush. Ooh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Hold on a minute. You've got that story. You've got that story in your Quran. Abdul, open your Quran. You don't have a Quran. In fact, I've never yet seen a Muslim with a Quran in their hands. Why is it you don't have a Quran? For one very good reason. Your Quran, first of all, is not a book you look and you read and understand. It's a book you memorize. Am I correct? And when you memorize it, you memorize it in Arabic. And more than likely, well, 85% of Muslims in the world don't speak Arabic. So immediately you can see the problem. You don't open the Quran and read it to understand it. You read it to memorize it. The reason you memorize it is because you want to receive barakah, 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 barakah. Barakah means blessings. You want to earn off your salvation. We'll get into that a little later. But let's go. In your Quran, I want you to open up to chapter 20. Now, you don't have it, so let me just tell you what it says. In chapter 20 of your Quran... In verse 10, Moses, he sees a fire in the distance. He wants to go to the fire to bring back some fire to start his own fires. As he approaches the bush that's burning, in verse 10, the voice from within the verse says, Moses, take off your shoes. You're on holy ground. Now, Abdul, holy ground. Isn't that where God would be? Can there be holy ground without God? No. By definition, if it's holy, that means God's there. So God's in that bush, right? Now, most Muslims say, no, no, that doesn't necessarily mean that. Well, then let's go to verse 14. Because in verse 14, it says that the voice within the bush says, truly, I am Allah who is speaking to you. Which means God is in that bush. Can anybody but God take on his name? No, only God can be called Allah. So there you have two verses in your Quran, which not only suggest that Allah is in that bush there on earth, because Moses is on earth, but it is he that is claiming, it is he, it is he, he's making that ground holy. So that means in 1400 B.C., God did come to earth at one time in your Quran. Ooh, I love that. And I can use that as a bridge because you can see we're talking really about a God that does enter time and space. So why do you Muslims have such a problem with God coming 2,000 years ago and entering time and space and living for 33 years and dying and rising on the cross? If God could do it with Moses, he could certainly do it with Jesus Christ. And I'm using your own Quran against you. This is what happens with the Quran. It borrows lots of stories from the Bible without understanding the meaning that goes with those stories. You don't dare touch the Bible unless you want to get the whole meaning that goes with it, including the story about the Garden of Eden. Now let me ask you, when you look at these two gods on this side, the name of God here is what? What is the name of God in the Old Testament? Well, there are actually three names, aren't there? Adonai, which is a descriptive name for God 340 times. Elohim, which is the closest you can get to the name of your God, because your God's name is what? Allah. Is that a name? 
No, it's not. Allah in Arabic means the God. It's a title. You're a man, right? You're the man. Does that define you? No, because there are lots of other men around here. So you need a name to say that you're distinction from everybody else here, right? Here your name is Abdul. Abdul the man. But Abdul is the name, the man is the title. Allah is the title. What is Allah's name? Have you noticed? Muslims have no answer for that. They have never in 37 years been able to give me a name. Well, we actually know the name of Allah now. We're doing some historical studies on your God. Allah is not even Arabic. Allah comes from the Nabataean language. The Nabataeans were the ones that created Arabic. The Nabataeans lived 600 miles further north. Their headquarters was Petra, not Mecca. And they all had a god named Ilaha, which is Allah in Arabic. Ilaha is a generic name for Dushara, which is the proper name of your god Allah. So he does have his name. His name is Dushara. So why are you using Allah and not Dushara? You don't know because you didn't write the Quran. So I can understand that. But it does say in the Quran very carefully that your God is one. Now, you also believe God is one as well. Isn't that right? Ahmed, just say yes. Yeah, he does. But here's what's fascinating. The God you're talking about, if he is one, he cannot have a son and he cannot have a wife. That's in chapter 6, verse 101, for Allah cannot have a concert. In chapter 4, verse 171, it says Allah cannot have a son. So it's very clear that Allah cannot have a son and he cannot have a wife. But then take a look at who Ilahi is. Look at, at who Ilahi, who is Dushara, because Ilah has a wife. Her name is Allat, which is the feminine form of Allah. Her formal name is Aluza. Now, does anybody here know what I've just done? Anybody know and have read the Quran? Do you know who Al Uzzah is and Allah is? Does anybody in here at all know what I'm talking about? No one? Open up your Quran and go to chapter 53 and go to verse 19 and 20, and you will see that these are known as the satanic verses. The satanic verses that Samu Rosti made very famous when he was under a death threat for bringing this up in a book that he wrote. The satanic verses talk about the goddess, Allah and Al Uzzah. Alat and Al Uzza and Al Manat, a third one. But it doesn't give any definition. It doesn't tell who they are. We now know who they are. This, this is the wife of Allah, which means your God has a wife. How can Allah be one if he has a wife? Ooh, I love that. Does our God have a wife? No. But does our God have a son? Yes, he does. And he's always been the son of God. Am I correct? Jesus has always been the Son of God and always will be the Son of God. And it does have nothing to do with biological relationship. It has to do with inheritance. Jesus, the Son of God, inherits everything that the Father inherits. That means they are uh, one, have always been one. Can you see the God that we've got over here? Let's talk about Jesus. Ooh, I love Jesus. The problem is you call him Issa. Issa is your Jesus. And when you look at Issa, Issa is not even Arabic. Did you know that? Issa is not Arabic. This is not an Arabic word. So where did you get this word Issa from? Because the word in Arabic for Jesus is Yeshua. Has always been for 2,000 years. Yeshua is the Arabic name for Jesus. Issa is the Quranic name for Jesus. We can't find Issa before the Quran. It was introduced by the Quran. Where in the world is this Issa come from? Is it Esau, the brother of Jacob? No, that's not Esau, that's Isau. So we already have that in Arabic. So where did Issa come from? Well, the answer to that, you need to do a little historical study on your book. When you look at this book, you will see that inside the Quran, there are re reference after reference to Issa. About 93 times it talks about Issa in this book. Now, when you look at the stories about him, my goodness, He's there in Surah, 19, uh, Surah 3, Ayah 46, in chapter 3, verse 46. He is there and speaking from the cradle. I had no idea Jesus could speak from the cradle. Does he in your Bible? But he does in chapter 3, verse 46. Three verses later, in three verse, chapter 3, verse 49 in your Quran, this little Issa as a baby takes some mud, forms it into birds, blows on it, and they fly up into the air, creates out of nothing these birds out of mud. Is that in the Bible? Did Jesus do that in the Bible? Not in my Bible, not in your Bible, but it's there in the Quran. In chapter 3, verse 49. In chapter 19, 
Mary and Jesus are out in the desert. They get hungry. Mary doesn't know what to do. So Jesus, again, as a baby, tells his mother, bend down that tree so you can get fruit, telling his mother how to eat. I had no idea that happened. Is that in your Bible? It's not in our Bible for a very good reason. These are apocryphal accounts. These are Gnostic accounts. These are heretical accounts written in the 2nd, 3rd, and 4th century AD, long after the Bible had already been canonized. These were written by Gnostics who were not Christians. They were sectarians. They were heretical. And they, were ta- they had story after story. The lost books of the Bible, the lost Arabic books of the Bible, the Nag Hammadi Gospel. That's where these stories come out of, not the Bible. Now, the name for Jesus in the Gnostic accounts in Syriac is Iesu. When you take the story, which you have done, you have lifted it and put it into the Quran. When you take the story and put it in the Quran, not only do you borrow the story, you borrow the name with it. The name that you have borrowed, Iesu, when it's translated into Arabic, is Issa. You've got a sectarian Jesus. You've got a heretical Jesus. You've got a Jesus who spends all his time as a baby making birds, telling his mother how to eat, and speaking from the cradle. But what does he do as an adult in this book? The most important thing he was supposed to do is die on the cross. Does Jesus die on the cross in this book? Yes, he does. Does Jesus die on the cross in this book? No, he doesn't. Issa does not die on the cross. Another takes his image. Another is given his image, and another man dies in his pace. And that one verse, chapter 4, verse 157 in the Quran, damns us all to eternity. Can you see why I refuse to accept Issa? He is not my Jesus. Ooh, but I love the Jesus on this side. This Jesus does come to earth, doesn't he? This Jesus does live 33 years on earth. This Jesus does die on the cross. And by dying on the cross and rising again, see, you believe that you celebrate your holy day on Friday. That's the day he died, right? Friday. We don't celebrate it on Friday. Why? Friday's here, but Sundays are coming. Sundays are coming. That's the day he rose from the death and destroyed death and rose from the grave. Now, I'm going to let you be my Eve, okay? Back, let's go back to Genesis 3 again. Let's go right back to the very beginning. In Genesis 3, it says that he was looking and he was asking, where are you? They finally, they come from behind the tree, right, Adam and Eve. And he turns to Eve in verse 15. He condemns them for what they had done. But look what God does in Verse 15 of chapter 3. He turns to Eve and he says, from your line, that means it has to be a woman's line. It has to be from a woman's line there that someone's going to come. And it's going to be he. That means it's going to be a male. A male is coming from the line of Eve. And this male is going to do something. He's going to crush the head of Satan, which means he's going to destroy Satan. And Satan's going to bruise his heel. Remember that in verse 15? This is the first prophecy we have in the Bible of the crucifixion. Now, you don't have that story in your Quran. In fact, your Quran does just the opposite. Your Quran says it wasn't he. Another took his place. Your Quran completely destroys that story. But within your Quran, you've got some problems. Because when you go to chapter 19, verse 33 in your Quran, you have Issa speaking again as a baby. Isn't it interesting? He's always speaking as a baby. And it says there, when they question who he is, he said, Blessed be me, Issa, the day I was born, the day I die, and the day I rise again. So Jesus himself in the Quran says he's going to die and rise again. What are you going to do with that? You have no idea. Muslims don't know what to do with chapter 19 when they compare it with chapter 4. Because there's an internal contradiction in the Quran. In chapter 3, verse 55, it gets even better. Allah speaks to Issa and says to Issa, Behold, for I will cause you to die. I will cause you mutawafika. That's the word in Arabic, mutawafika. Do you know this word, mutawafika? I will cause you to die. It does not say I will cause you to sleep, does it? Tawafik is die, not sleep. Every Arab knows that. So even the Quran has an internal contradiction. Oh, I love it because I can just use it against you, Abdul. You've got to deal with it. You've got to deal with your own Quran. Nonetheless, when you look and you ask any Muslim today, they say that Jesus did not die. Issa did not die. And probably that's right. Issa did not die, but Yeshua did. Yeshua did. And that's why I go with Yeshua. And see, when you look at the Jesus that we have in the Bible, this Jesus, he pretty much defends everything we want, everything we do. We go back to this Jesus. But see, this Jesus comes down our level, comes and enters time and space, which means he comes down to us, right? This Jesus comes our direction, like he did the Garden of Eden. 
comes and walks and talks for 33 years, dies for us, which means that he is taking care of everything that he had promised through Eve. Why did he have to die? You Muslims are asking me all this time, why did God have to die? Great question. In order to understand that, you need to go back to the Garden of Eden again. Go back to chapter 3. That's why we're there today. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve are in the same garden with God. Am I correct? There is God walking and talking in the cool of day. Adam and Eve, they're in the same garden. That means there was a relationship between Adam and Eve and God. Am I correct? Yes. God was talking to them face to face. That relationship exists. That relationship is not in your account. Nowhere is Allah in that garden, which means Allah never comes face to face with man, has never had a relationship with mankind. You have no idea what you're missing. We know what we're missing. Don't you want to be talking and walking with God again? I do. But you can't if you read the Quran, because there was no reference of God walking and talking in the Kudul of the day. And if he was not walking and talking in the Kudul of the day in the Quran, then you can see why there's no relationship with, and that's why your God, you have no idea who Allah is. He is totally other, totally distant, never comes to earth. Even his name is not a name. It's nothing more than a title. He has never walked and talked with mankind. If God never walked and talked with mankind, then you have no idea what sin has done. Sin for you is just basically Keep in the grade, right? You have all these rules and regulations, how to walk, talk, eat, drink, sleep, how to wear your clothes, how long a beard to grow. In every area of life, 24-7, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you have law after law after law as to how you're to walk. These are called Sharia laws. You have four different schools. You have uh, Fiqh, you have the Hanbali school, you have the Shafi school, you have the Maliki school, you have the Hanafi school. All of these litigations of litigation after litigation of what you're supposed to do, which is what I would expect if your God is nothing more than a master and you're nothing more than a slave. That's how masters work with slaves. Your relationship to God is one of slavery. Your relationship to God is one of servitude. Your relationship to God is one of obedience. That's why you call yourself Muslim, someone who obeys, someone who serves. Is that your relationship to God? God? No. What do you call yourself? Slaves of God? Children of God. You're a child of God. Am I correct? And we even give the name Abba. Abba means daddy. Ooh, I love that. Now, Ahmed, as a child of God, can you um, talk to your God as a father? Yes, you can. Can you talk to your God as a father? No, you can't. Look at your Prayers that you do five times a day, you start with the Fatiha. It is the same rote prayers, it's the same formula every day, five times a day, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after, it's exactly the same prayer. You do not expect a response from God, there is no relationship in that prayer, there's no idea of a two-way street, whereas when you talk to God, you know God's going to respond, don't you? Where do you pray? Well, you pray in your prayer room. What direction do you pray? Towards Mecca. Am I correct? Just say yes. Where do you pray? Anywhere you want. In what direction? In any direction. In what language do you pray? In Arabic. Only one language. What language do you pray? In any language. Are you starting to see the difference here? You have a God that you have to pray towards Mecca five times a day. Oh, that's the only time you pray to him. You have to do it in Arabic. That is as colonial as you can get. You've got an Arab God who only can speak one language. You've got a God that comes down and can, is omnipresent, is everywhere, even in the toilet. Oh, you don't like that when I say that. But your God's even in the toilet, isn't he? Our God is everywhere. Our God, we can pray at any time, all day long if we want to, in any direction, and in every language, because our God is a universal God. What a God we have. No, you're not supposed to clap. Stop it. You're Muslims. You should be sour-faced by now. I feel sorry for all the deaf people because they have to take on them whether they like it or not. You have to be careful. Do you see why you want to come this direction? I can see it. Already they're clapping for what you've got. They don't have it yet, but you're going to give it to them, aren't you? We're going to show them what they're missing. So the God we're talking about is a universal God. The God we're talking about can understand everybody. That's why when he comes down to our place in our language, he speaks like us, he walks like us, he talks like us. All the way through history, you see him over and over again coming down over and over again 
wooing us to himself. This God never gives up on us. Does your God give up on you? Absolutely. So who does your God love? Only those who obey him. Only those who submit to him. Only Muslims. What about your God? Does he love everybody? Yes. Does he love the sinners? Absolutely. No, well, let's go back to this back and forth. Your God allows you to talk to him. Does your God allow you to criticize him? Yeah. As a good father, are you a father? Do you have children? Do they criticize you? You're following your God's example, aren't you? I have three sons. Boy, do they criticize me. And I love they do because I, as a father, have to act exactly like my father in heaven did with us. Does your Allah allow you to criticize him? No. Absolutely not. Does your God allow you to reject him? Be careful how you answer that. Depends if you're reformed or not. I'm Arminian. Thank God I'm Arminian. Because my God allows me even to reject him. How do you do? What do you do with the prodigal son? That's a beautiful story. See, there's the father. The son says, I want to take my inheritance. I want to leave you, father. He rejects his father, takes his inheritance, runs to a faraway land. What does the father do? Does the father reject the son? No, he doesn't. He stands at the doorway day after day waiting for his son to come home. That's my God. And when he sees his son in the distance, he runs out, grabs him, hugs him, and has a banquet for him. Oh, my God is that kind of God. He allows me to reject him, and he allows me to receive him. And when we accept him, my God has a banquet. What a God we have got. But your God, your God doesn't even let you to accept or reject him. You are by definition, as soon as you are born, you are a Muslim. You were born to Islam. You had no choice in the matter. And you cannot reject him. You cannot reject him. Chapter 4, verse 94 says very clearly, if anybody rejects or leaves Islam, they must be killed. And that's why you have the law of apostasy. The law of apostasy is endemic to the Quran. It's endemic to Islam. Every school of law, the Maliki, the Shafi, the, Ma the Hanbali, and the Hanafi school, all four schools stipulate that they must be killed if they reject Islam. The only difference between the four schools is of what day you, you kill them, either the third day or the tenth day. But you must kill them. Yusuf Qaradawi, one of the most famous clerics today, said on Al Jazeera television not too long ago, he says, Islam would not exist without the apostate law. We would not have any Islam if we let people choose whether or not they could stay or remain. But my God lets me choose. We have freedom of choice. Look at every parable that Christ taught. Every parable that Christ taught requires a choice. Did you notice that? Everything Christ said requires a choice. We are given that choice. You have no choice. That's why I don't want anything to do with your God. You are nothing more than puppets. You are nothing more, really, than robots. Even your God tells you what you're to think, tells you to what you're to choose. That's why you say, um, uh, 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 you, every time you say, what's the word I forget? I've already forgotten my Arabic. Not Bismillah al-Rahman. What's the word? Inshallah. If God wills it. You have to say that after every decision. Only if God wills it will you do what you do. My God lets me make my own decision. My God lets me choose whom I want. And my God allows me because that's what a loving father would do. That's what a relational father would do. He let Adam and Eve choose him or reject him, right? Now there are consequences to that rejection. Of course there are consequences. But even the consequences of Adam and Eve's choice, even that God already gave a solution to Eve. Someone from your line is going to come and crush the head. Because when you reject God, when you sin against God... One sin is all it took because our God is so holy. He's such a holy God that he cannot even allow one sin in his presence. Cha Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 13. God cannot look upon sin. That's how holy our God is. We can't be in God's presence when we sin. Which means we're all damned, right? No, because of chapter 3 verse 15. God said to Eve, he is going to come. <coughs> I'm losing my voice. He's going to come and crush the head of Satan which means you destroy Satan. Now, what do we know about that? Well, all the way through the Scriptures, you will see over and over again how God sends prophet after prophet to woo the people back to him and finally sends his own son. Why? Because Leviticus 17 says very clearly, in order for there to be atonement, 
Life must be given, blood must be shed. Am I correct? It's very clear, right through the Bible, 79 times about atonement. You have no idea what we're talking about because there's no such thing as atonement in, in Islam. In the Quran, nobody can take on another one's sin. Nobody can be blamed for another one's guilt. Chapter 6, verse 164. Chapter 53, verse 38. All of this, all of this is done by you. We know that none of this can be done by us. If we can't even be in the presence of a holy God with just one sin, and that's all that Adam and Eve had was just one sin, how can we be in his presence with a multiplicity of sins? And how can we pay the price of that sin? <clears throat> because the price, of the price of sin is death. That means we're all dead. Unless God would come himself. And maybe that's the person he was talking with Eve. He. So who is this he that he mentioned to Eve? Well, go to Isaiah. Isaiah gives us a solution. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. I'm giving it as easy as I can. Chapter 7, that's the perfect number. 14 is double the perfect number. He says this, For this shall be a sign a virgin will conceive. Now hold on, folks. Virgins don't conceive in my world. Do they in yours? No, they don't. By definition, if a virgin conceives, she's no longer a virgin. But Isaiah says, this will be the sign. Wake up. Something miraculous has happened. A virgin will conceive and bear a son. There's the son we're talking about, Eve. There's the male. Now, you Muslims, you also know that there's only one virgin. In your Quran, who is the virgin in chapter 19, verse 20? In the Quran. Anybody know her name? Abdul, do you know the name? Abdul is going to help you. It's Miriam. That's correct, Abdul. You're a better Muslim than you are a Christian. <laughs> You're on the wrong side. Keep there. Stay there. We want you there. See, this is what's fascinating. You notice the Christian had an answer for the Muslim? When you don't know an answer, in chapter 10, verse 94 of the Quran, in chapter 21, verse 7 of the Quran, it says, if you have no answer, who do you come to? You come to Ahmed. You come to the Christians. Come to the Ali Kitab, the people of the book. Whenever you don't have a question, you're to come to us on this side. You're to come back because we have been given the answer. And what will you do? You'll take them right to Isaiah 7, 14, won't you? Because there it says that a virgin will conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be called what? Emmanuel. What does Emmanuel mean? God, not you. God, boy, don't you like They're already coming home. God with us. Okay, for those of us who said over in this side, God with us, what does that mean? That means God is with us. That means he's here in our presence. When Emmanuel is born, according to Isaiah, God will be with us. You've got that in your Quran in chapter 19, verse 20. That means when, Je when Mary, the virgin, had a son, that's the sign. Wake up. God's with us. Ooh, isn't that great? You can use the Quran against them. Please don't. Keep this book small. You notice I keep which one's smaller, which one's bigger? This is the bigger, the better book. Always come back to this book because this book is so confusing about Allah. This book is so confusing about Muhammad. And this book is so confusing about salvation. Now let's end this off with salvation. How do you get salvation? Well, there's not a thing you can do about it, really, although you think you can do it by building up your baraka, 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 about your blessings on this side. Every one of you Muslims, when you were born, you were given an angel that sits on this shoulder that records your good deeds. You're given another angel that sits on this shoulder that records your bad deeds. Fortunately, they're invisible, so you can't see them. Nonetheless, you all have recording angels on each shoulder. And what you believe is, and what the Quran says very clearly, that these recording angels, they basically, your bad deeds are placated by your good deeds. So it's like a credit, uh, it's like a debit uh, and credit account. It's like a bank account. Your debit's over here, your credit's on this side. Now stop and think. Aren't all man-made religions, do they not all start with that same premise? Any religion made by man always starts with debits and credits, debits and credits. Islam is nothing new under the sun. It's just what man would think up. But on our side, there is no debits and credits. We cannot do anything about our debits. There's not even one thing we can do about one debit. That's how heinous sin is. Sin is that huge, that enormous, that just one sin threw us out of God's presence. And I want to get in God's presence. You do too, don't you? How are we going to do it? We cannot do it by doing good deeds, folks. No wonder it's invisible. It never was there. There are no recording angels. Because we know that even one sin would throw us out of God's presence, as it did with Adam and Eve. So therefore, we can't do a thing about it. It has to be he who was sinned against. 
He who is sinned against is the one that's going to do it for us. God himself, talking to Eve, said to Eve, I'm going to do this solution. I'm going to condemn you. He did condemn Adam and Eve in chapter 3, but right there as a good father, as a loving father, a relational father would do, he said, I'm going to destroy this sin. It's going to be me who's going to come. And that's why when you look at the cross, the thing that you've thrown out of your scriptures, we keep in our scriptures because that's where it was done at the cross. So when you talk about sin and salvation, what a salvation we have. There's not a thing we can do about our salvation. It has all been done for us by God himself. So on the other side of death, what are you waiting for? You're waiting for a garden. Look at chapter 55. Look at chapter 56. Look at chapter 76 in your Quran. And take and see what kind of garden you have. Now, you're sitting next to Abdul there. You're a woman, right? Of course you are. Uh, what's waiting for you in heaven? Ask Abdul what's waiting for him. Abdul, you know what's waiting for you. There's going to be a garden. There are going to be rivers of water. There are going to be rivers of wine. Rivers of wine. Hold on, Abdul. Can you drink wine here? No, you can't. But when you get to heaven, you can swim in it. Isn't that a contradiction? When you are here on earth, you're supposed to cover up your woman. She's not covered up. Shame on her. But you're supposed to either have a hijab or a jilbab or a niqab or a purla or a chador, something to cover her up. And the reason you cover up is so no other male can look on her. So you're to cover up your women here so they do not take on, uh, they do not uh, seduce anybody. Now whose fault is it that she is beautiful? And who, where is the sin here? Is the sin with her or is the sin with you as a male? Yes. But you're making the female pay for your sin. Doesn't that go against chapter 6, verse 164, that no one can take on the guilt of another? Ooh, I love that one. Nonetheless, you're not supposed to look upon your women on this life, but you can have 72 of them waiting for you in heaven. Isn't that contradictory? What kind of heaven is that? Wine, women, and song. It's a carnal heaven, folks. You can get that in Las Vegas, Abdul. <laughs> is that what you're waiting for? Guys and gals? Is it wine, women, and song? Is that what we're waiting for in heaven? I don't care about wine. I don't care about, sorry, women. I don't really care about women. That's not what I want. I want what Adam and Eve had. I want to be walking with God again. I want to be talking with God again. I want to be in the presence of God. They have no idea what we're talking about. Now, do you want to come home? Should we bring them all home? Jesus is Lord. Come on, I want to hear you say it. Jesus is Lord. It is Jesus that allows you to come home. It is Jesus that paid the price. It is Jesus that said, yes, you have all the sin is destroyed by one death on the cross. Not just any death, not your death. There's not a thing you can do about it. It had to be God himself who died. It had to be God himself who entered time and space. It had to be God himself who promised he would do that. It was God himself who did it 2,000 years ago. And because of what God did 2,000 years ago, though sin was destroyed, I mean, though salvation was destroyed through sin at the Garden of Eden, it was rectified because of the crucifixion, which means we know where we're going to be on the other side of death. We're going be walking with God again. We're going to be able to talk with God again because of what he did on the cross again. Ooh, I love Jesus. Yes, he deserves a huge applause. And there is the whole salvation story. But can you see with Muslims, you need to start from the very beginning. You need to help them realize what sin did. You need to help them realize that salvation was destroyed because of one act, one act. And if one act destroyed that salvation, one act destroyed that relationship, there is the key that they're missing. They don't even know what's going on because in the Quranic paradise, Allah is not there. In the Quranic paradise, Allah never comes to earth. In the Quranic story, he never dies on the cross. And if God does not die on the cross, then sin has not been placated. There has been no answer to the problem of sin. And that's why they are still trying to work off their salvation. And all they have to look forward to is a carnal paradise for men, nothing for women. And I want to make sure there are both men and women in, God, in paradise. We're all going to be with God again. Oh, I can't wait. Don't get me there any quicker than I need to go. <laughs> Meanwhile, we have a little bit of our steak on our plate while we wait, but I can't wait for the pie in the sky when I die. Isn't it great we've got a great God? Isn't it great that Jesus has taken care of everything? Isn't it great that we have a great story to tell our Muslims? Oh, you're not Muslims anymore. I can't point to you any longer. Abdul, welcome home. God bless you. You can now a brother in Christ. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, it's so good to know that we can come to you, not to see not only because what you did 2,000 years ago, but to see what you're continuing to do in each one of our lives. 
I thank you, Lord, not only for your salvation. I thank you, Lord, because you wooed us back all the way through history. You never gave up on us. You are our daddy. And as a daddy would do to a child, a daddy would not only love, love that child, would never, ever stop loving him. Even when that child rejects him, you never stop rejecting us. And that's why when we look at the gospel, when we look at your scripture, when we look and see your example, that's the example we're to give. That's the example we're to have as loving fathers to our children. But Lord, as we look and we see that, we ask that in everything we do, we represent you. Thank you, Lord, for what you have done in our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now before we get into the music, I have one more thing. There's an awful lot that I threw at you today, and you're probably are saying this is going to go over your head. We have put together a course to help you called Fander Course, P-F-A-N-D-E-R. When you go out to the back table there, the one that the awning, sign up for our course. It's every week on Tuesdays. At, I think it's 11 o'clock in the morning, but you don't have to come to us. We come right to your computer. We come through Zoom webinar. It's an hour and a half starting on September 25th all the way up to April. It's the only course that will teach you how to answer what the Muslims are saying and how to then take the same uh, responses right back. It's both apologetics and polemics. We cannot teach this in a seminary. We cannot teach this in a Bible school because if we were to teach this, the Muslims would find out and target that seminary. So we have to come to you. If you are interested in that course, please sign up. Today is the last day for registration. If you sign up, Make sure I can read your email. I do not, I will not go if I can't read your email. That's also in my prayer letter. If you want to get on our prayer letter to not only to, so we can, so you can pray for our ministry, uh, Fander Films and Fander Ministry, we would love to have you. But remember, in everything you do, make sure you talk about Jesus and the Bible. God bless you. It's been great having you here. <laughs>